Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Emmanuel. Welcome to God's house. And a special welcome to you. If this is your first time here or you're a repeat visitor, we really do see that as a privilege. It's an honor to be here with you worshiping and to host you this morning as God uh, really communicates to us an incredibly important topic to him that he wants to be important for us. I don't know if you've ever had this experience before. Have you ever... um, been really passionate about something or really consumed with a book you've read or you just love history or um, hunting and fishing is your thing or you're consumed with a new relationship and you're trying to convey to someone that you care about how important this is to you and you're telling them all about it and you can kind of see their eyes glaze over and they kind of start to tune out. You know how that feels? It kind of sucks the joy out of the retelling for you. If you've ever experienced that, then you know just a little bit how Jesus feels too. You can understand him. What he says he is consumed with, what he is so passionate about, is saving souls for eternity. And he saved yours. It's the thing that he has most on his mind, and my dear friends, It's important to him that we be passionate about it too. That's the theme of our worship this morning, sharing Jesus' passion for souls. I hope you were able to either grab a white worship folder on your way in. If not, that's okay. The the entirety of the service is projected for you this morning on our screens. Let's begin our worship then by praising our God, this God who loves us so much. We'll sing our opening hymn, O Lord of Light. If you're able, would you please stand?
Jesus shares his passion for souls with us in Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners, that's in quotes because it's how the world might perceive people to be sinful, what makes them sinful, were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them? Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I found my lost sheep! I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And what do these words of God help me to see? We pray. Lord, I confess that it was not any worthiness on my part that prompted your coming to save me, but simply your love and deep concern for a lost soul. And though you are repulsed and offended by my sin, you paid the ransom for me with your very own life. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. What do these words of God help me to see? We pray. Lord, your death is the proof that I am at peace with you. That makes us friends. And you have chosen me to play an important role in bringing you more friends. Help me to love others. Help me to bear lasting fruit in my life. Help me to serve you joyfully in my occupation, to be selfless toward my family, to care about the thoughts I think, the words I speak, and the actions I display, because they all reflect on you. And if my poor reflection should cause anyone to want to know you, then help me remember that it is only because you live in me. Thank you, Jesus, for choosing me.
from 1 John chapter 3. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. In James chapter 2, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, then what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. These are the words of our God. Do those words ring kind of strangely in our Lutheran ears? Maybe because we know that only faith in Jesus' work is what saves us. Our works don't save us. But Jesus says saving faith always produces work. And so really it's a challenge to our hearts. If I find myself saying, be warm, well well fed, but really don't have any pity, don't take any action to help, then I should probably reevaluate how living is my faith. Because it's what my Savior has done for me. What do these words of God help me to see? We pray. Lord, forgive me whenever my selfish actions have drowned out my words. Help me to truly love others, to put their needs and worries and cares ahead of my own. You have promised to care for me so that I can concern myself with care for others. Make me generous, helpful, and patient so that I never miss a chance to express my love for you. And then, should you grant me an opportunity to tell someone about the why in my life, make me bold. Thank you, Jesus, for letting me serve you. My brothers and sisters in Jesus, unasked, undeserved, Unearned, your God has forgiven all your sins. He punished Jesus for your sin and he credits you with Jesus' sin-free life. You are alive. You are free. You are his. Go and share your good news in peace. may be seated. My dear friends in Jesus, it was your, your typical, my dad is bigger than your dad type of argument because Kevin's dad could open any jar of pickles and Sean's dad could punch a hole through cardboard And now it was Timmy's turn. Timmy had the floor, and all eyes were on him. Timmy knew his dad was strong. So he said, my dad can lift up our van. Uh Uh-oh. The look on his friend's faces kind of betrayed their amazement and their disbelief. And so Timmy knew he had to follow up the statement. He said, no, yesterday, when my dad was changing oil, he lifted the van right off the floor. Of course, Timmy's dad wins. And of course, they all got to go find Timmy's dad. So they're on the hunt. They go and find Timmy's dad. He's in the family room. He's watching TV. Dad, 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 says Timmy. Dad, show him. Can you go lift up the van? 
Okay, roll that back again, Timmy. Dad, yesterday when you, when you were changing oil, you lifted the van up. Oh, son, I, I was using a hydraulic lift and you didn't see it underneath the van. I, I can't lift up our van. Timmy shot a glance to his friends and what he saw in their faces made him regret ever opening his big mouth. Have you ever felt like that? Bragging about your Savior? You were on fire and motivated and so moved by his love for you at the cross that you told someone it didn't go well. I challenged you, or they objected to what you said, or the door slammed, whatever it was. You've been, you've been stung in the past, or you're terrified of that happening. Of someone saying, well, what about... And you not having the answer. And did you feel like in that moment, as you were fumbling for the right reply and to try to say it succinctly and clearly, you felt like the weight of all of God's kingdom was in the balance based on your reply? Well, oh, relax. It wasn't. You're still right. And your faith will be proved right one day in the end. But if you've been terrified by that idea of sharing Jesus with someone... And God really wants to encourage you today. What we're going to see in John chapter 1 is the most important step in being able to share Jesus with someone. In fact, we're going to look at five steps. And we're going to do that by watching a man in action, a man named Philip, share Jesus with someone. So our five important steps to sharing Jesus as we learn from a man named Philip in John chapter 1. This is what it says in verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him. And we're just going to stop there. The first step in sharing Jesus with someone is that you have to leave. Now, that sounds really simplistic. Don't laugh at me. But it, it's the truth. See, if you never leave here, then you can't ever share. And I'm not... In, in, in any way suggesting that anyone spends all their time here. Even pastors don't spend all their time here, right? We all have lives outside of our church. But the point is this. If you spend all of your important conversations, if you have all of your spiritual discussions, if you talk about eternity and the things that matter most, just here, then you never get to do it out there. You see what Philip did? God found Philip. God chose Philip. The Savior showed up in person. The answer to everything that has ever plagued humanity showed up and chose Philip. And Philip suddenly had what he'd always wanted. And look what he did. He didn't just stay there. The Bible says he left. Philip went and found Nathaniel and told him. Because to share Jesus, you have to leave. And, and don't get me wrong, what we have been blessed with here at Emmanuel, I'm just finding this out with every passing day, it is so special. The bond that kind of cements us together in Jesus, it actually goes beyond family and blood, doesn't it? And what we get to share together here and online is to sing together and hear together and learn together and grow together. And God says those are special blessings that belong just to this group of people, to my believers. But if we never leave, then we leave a bunch of opportunities 
out there. If we never leave the family that we love so much here, we never get to share Jesus with our missing family out there. So our first step is we have to leave. The second step is simple too. If we leave and find someone, then what we tell them is really important and we want to tell the truth. Did you notice what Nathaniel did? He didn't try to imp- or what Philip did, he didn't try to impress Nathaniel with anything other than Jesus. Verse 45, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He didn't try to impress Nathaniel with anything other than what, what the promise of meeting Jesus, right? He told Nathaniel who he had found. Nathaniel. The one that God promised, the one that he wrote about for centuries, the one that's supposed to remove my guilt and the burden of my anxiety and the resentment I have in this life and the fear that I have about the next life, the one that's supposed to take care of all of that, we've got him. And Nathaniel must have been looking for those things and Philip and Nathaniel must have talked about those things. So Philip says, here's the answer. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What a great application for us when we have the opportunity to tell someone about Jesus. Then we want to tell them about him. If our intention is to share Jesus, share him. Because finally... All the wonderful activities and programs that we might have at our church, the personality of our pastor, the really cool families and relationships that we've made here, finally, people can find those things in other places. And those are things I'm proud of here, and those are things God has worked wonderfully here. Don't get me wrong. But if I'm pointing people to that, the reason you've got to come to church is because of this and that and this, then what I'm really doing is, is pointing people's happiness and their peace and their rest into something that won't fulfill those things. Because not one of those blessings that belongs to us here in Emmanuel ties directly to the giver of those blessings. The only one that ties directly to the giver is Jesus. And so if we're going to share Jesus, we want to tell the truth. We want to share Him. That's step number two. Tell the truth. Of course, when you tell the truth, fair warning, it's not always pretty. Sometimes you will be challenged and sometimes people will have objections. And that's, I know, what you're terrified of, right? Me too. That's what happened to Philip. Nathaniel challenged him immediately. This is what Nathaniel said. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Well, come and see, Philip said. That brings us to step three. Don't argue. Sometimes people want to argue for argument's sake and sometimes you do need to remove obstacles and and remove objections but the truth is very often arguments, objections and challenges are just a smokescreen for someone who doesn't want to deal with the big and most important topics of life. Sometimes they're sharing an objection or challenging you not because they're waiting to hear the answer because they don't want to deal with what you have to say. And if you truly care for someone, if you genuinely care about that person, then you know what that means? You have to take the time to hear them out. And that's what Philip did. Philip said, we found the one, and and, and it's Jesus of Nazareth, and Nathaniel is spoiling for a fight. He's got the boxing gloves on. Nazareth! Can anything good come from there? And what did Philip do? Just listen. He didn't take the bait. He didn't run down a rabbit hole. 
See, the Holy Spirit doesn't need your and my defense to create faith in someone's heart. But if we spend all of our time with objections and challenges and never get to Jesus, then the Holy Spirit has nothing to work with. He can't create faith, at least not how God has promised. Philip heard the objection and then he doesn't respond. Sometimes it's necessary to respond. Sometimes it's not. He chooses not to respond and then what does he do? He returns to the real topic at hand. Come and see. I know this is what terrifies you. Pastor, what about if someone asks, what, what about if someone says, what do you say when, and here's the beauty, you don't have to answer every question. You don't have to be able to answer every objection. Just don't let those objections and your time spent on them Keep the Holy Spirit from doing his work. Uh, maybe, I've thought a lot about this over the years. And the Bible doesn't tell us why Philip doesn't answer Nathaniel. So I, have, I have two ideas, and you can pick either one. I have one that I prefer, but I guess Scripture's silent, so we can just speculate. Maybe Philip didn't want to go down a rabbit hole and didn't want to get into an argument, and he knew they'd get sidetracked and, and Nathaniel would never, they'd never get to talking about Jesus. Maybe that's why he did it, and he was wise. Or maybe, and this is what I tend to think, maybe Philip didn't have the answer. See, Philip and Nathaniel knew that the Messiah was supposed to come from Bethlehem, and yet they knew this guy came from Nazareth, so maybe... Because they didn't know Jesus was born in Bethlehem and then his parents moved him at a very young age to keep him safe from Herod. Maybe Philip was stumped by Nathaniel's challenge and he couldn't explain it. But he didn't lose confidence because his confidence wasn't in his ability to be able to answer every, every objection and answer every question. His confidence was in Jesus. See, Philip was right about Jesus and who he was, whether he could explain it or not. It was a truth that sometimes defies debate and resists analysis. He had been brought to faith in Jesus. And he wasn't about to get sidetracked with an argument. So he says, yeah, uh, Nathaniel, I hear you. Come and see. Let's let Jesus answer your questions. Which brings us to step four. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, I'll grant you the amazing thing in this account is that Jesus can see things when he's not there. He saw something take place in another place. But step four is much more simple than that. Step four is very simply, when you're looking to share people share Jesus with someone, connect them to the Word. See, step four is the one that you can't skip. You could rearrange all the other steps here and the other things that Philip did. You could even skip some of the steps and God doesn't need those steps to bring someone to faith. But God has tied himself by a promise to this one. This one is essential and God has at least not promised to bring people to faith any other way than you sharing with someone the Word of God, the Word that creates faith, that gospel, dynamic power, that earth-changing, soul-saving, sin-destroying message of God taking His hero and putting him into our fairy tale. Granted, our story's not a tale and it has nothing to do with fairies, but the similarity is this. The message is so amazing and heart-saving and, and tears of joy inducing, inducing that God has promised you a happy ending 
through His Son, Jesus. He promises it to you. But none of that is a reality without connecting to the Word, without step four. And so Philip, rather than argue with Nathaniel, he just says, come and see. He connects Nathaniel directly to the Word, to Jesus. And my dear friends, we finally have to come to terms with that, right? For every fear that we've created in our minds, for every question that someone might ask me, well, then what about, well, have you ever thought about, well, what do you say to, for every one of those what-if questions that someone might ask, finally, at some point, I have to connect them to Jesus I have to let my answer be, come and see. Because the reality is, you and I can't explain faith. And reason's quest for answers and rational solutions won't ever fully be satisfied by, some, by a relationship that exists by faith. So I won't finally be able to solve every question and give every answer at some point. I need to give them Jesus. Because real peace, like soul peace, and real rest, like spiritual rest, and all of the real answers to the real questions can only be found in and seen in and heard in Jesus Christ. Connect them to the Word. There is a step five, but it's a little subtle and it's easy to miss if you aren't looking very carefully. Step five, I think, is more of an assumption that we can safely make. I don't know if you saw it. In Philip's invitation to Nathaniel, we're assuming something, right? That when he says, come and see to Nathaniel, that Philip is going back to Jesus. Because what he doesn't say is, hey, Nathaniel, all the questions that we've talked about, all the spiritual angst that we struggle with, I found the answer. Go find Jesus of Nazareth. I'll tell you where to find him. He's going to be able to answer all your questions. He doesn't say that. He says, come and see, because I'm going back, because I'm going to keep growing in my faith, and I want to spend time with Jesus. My faith is going to continue to blossom and grow. I'm going to go with you. That's step five, finally, to go with. Do you know how powerful that is? Do you hear the difference between saying to someone, we got this great class at our, at our church, uh, January 25th and 27th, the God and Me class. It's so good. All the things that you've been struggling with is going to answer all your questions. You've got to go. I'll, I'll get you signed up. Do you hear the difference then in you saying, i got to go and feed my faith on January 25th or 27th. I'm going to go get refreshed and grow closer to my Savior. Do you want to come with me? Let's go have Jesus answer what we need. Do you know what a privilege it is when someone is introduced to Jesus for the very first time, what a privilege it is to be there during that introduction. And really, when you think about it, what better way can people who care about each other spend together than spending time in God's powerful, life-saving Word? So there's your five steps from Philip. And God says the only essential thing you need uh, to, to, to accomplish those five steps is this. You have to have something to share. That's it. So, in your opportunities to witness and share Jesus with someone, if you follow these five steps, will it be a happy ending? You know, God doesn't promise that to you. 
He doesn't promise that that person will come to faith. But here's the thing. He hasn't given that job to you, has he? It's his job to create the happy endings. He's the only one that can create faith in the heart of people. Your job is just sharing. My brothers and sisters, let's be about our Savior's business. Do you have something to share? Oh boy, you do. I suppose it's not fair to to end here this morning without sharing with you the ending of Philip and Nathaniel. It's just one verse. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Another happy ending worked by God. Amen. The peace of God which goes so far beyond our ability to understand it. That's what keeps our hearts and our minds in saving faith until Jesus brings us safely home to heaven. Amen. I invite you now to listen to and read the words of our fifth and sixth grades as they bring our praise to our Savior. If you, as a part of your worship this morning, had brought an offering of thanks to our Savior, uh, you can feel free to deposit that in the offering plate as you leave or, or just give uh, online. If you're visiting this morning, though, please don't feel compelled to give. Uh, that's something our members here at Emmanuel do out of love and thanks to their Savior. They want to do it. Um, let's continue worshiping our God in prayer. If you're able, would you please stand? We pray. Gracious God, King of all this world, 
Your love for us is limitless. And it's in the context of that kind of love that you sent your son Jesus into our world to save us. It was in that love that you found us, like you found Philip, with your forgiveness and caused us to believe its truth. And now that we know and believe in your love for us, we see our mission so clearly, Lord. Just as you sent your son to give us life, so now we live in this world to proclaim that good news that brings life. Make us faithful to our mission. Give us your own eyes of love to see that this work you've given us begins with our own families and extends outward to all people because your grace is for all people. Give us the boldness to share your word free from every fear that might hold us back or hinder us from speaking your truth. Lord, let the joy of your undeserved love fill our hearts that we may always praise you. And now hear us as we pray to you the prayer that you taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Dear friends in Jesus, you and I have been forgiven a debt enormous in quantity, a debt to, it, to God which is the result of our very own sins. Let's enjoy his grace together this morning in his holy supper. By faith we see our Savior's true body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine, given and shed for us. By faith we hear our Savior's words of power and promise, that our Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. may be seated. 
As we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper this morning, just a reminder to us about what this means. We believe Jesus' words when he says, this supper that he's given is meant as a spiritual benefit and blessing, a reassurance of the forgiveness of his believers. We also believe Jesus' words when he warns us that it's not a blessing to all of his people, to all of his believers, that it can harm people's faith in certain circumstances. And so for that reason, if you're visiting today, we'd ask that you'd kindly refrain from taking the Lord's Supper. If you're not a member here at Emmanuel or one of our affiliated churches, until we've had the opportunity to talk about this over an open Bible, we sure would love a chance to commune together in the future. Those of you who are communing this morning may come forward at our usher's direction. Come for all things are now ready.
This true body and blood of your Savior Jesus will strengthen and keep you in faith until he calls you home to heaven. So go in peace. Live with joy. By his promise, all your sins are forgiven. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to uh, please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Because you had become so dear to us. We dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. These are the words of our God. You see what Jesus' passion is? His passion to share the truth that you're forgiven through him and then passion to share his life with you. And as his people, our only thank you can be a passion to share him and then to share our lives with each other. I'll go with his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We close our worship this morning by singing our final hymn, the first three verses.
Thanks once more for the tremendous privilege of worshiping our gracious God together. Uh, thanks to all who are involved and everyone who's here both online and in person. Uh, just a couple of things to highlight for you. Um, please do read through all of your news and notes, both for the school and uh, for um, Manitowoc Lutheran High School. Everything included in our, in our announcement sheet that I think is yellow this week. Um, I want to introduce to you Mr. Jason Sweeney. If you don't know him, he's been recently elected as our chairman of, for the Board of Education. And he's just going to introduce himself to you and, and explain to you a little bit about what their board does. Sure. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Jason Sweeney, and I'm the newly elected chairperson for the Board of Education. Um, every January, we try to touch base with the congregation because the church, the school, are really blended into one with the goal of educating the children. Like Pastor Sermon said, connecting the word. You get to see it every day at that school, and it's thanks to the dedicated professionals that we have over there, our faculty, our staff, and the parents who send their kids, and your congregation who supports them with prayers. As we move forward into 2021 here, I just wanted to give you guys a quick update. School is still in session. We are still moving forward. The kids are learning and they're doing wonderful. Thanks to the hard work of an excellent staff, faculty, Board of Ed, and like I said, the parents. We've been continuing to have in-person learning and will continue in the future. I do want to do a couple quick things and that's introduce our new Board of Ed. If you look towards the back, I see Rob Wire, who is now our Board of Education representative at MLHS. Jeff Dolan, who is now our liaison to the PI, uh, before and after care in the preschool. We also have Nate Hockmuth, who is our property in athletics, and Brad Washaleski, who is our secretary. Um, as we, like I said, as we move forward, we're doing a lot of great things. And the big thing is connecting the word to God. We have the kids singing, we have basketball in session. If you look at Facebook Live, you will see the kids, they'll be streaming the games and stuff. I've heard we had some pretty success so far, right guys? Bad, okay, thanks. Um, and also, as we move forward, we wanna expand our school. We wanna share that word of God. January 30th is our open house from 10 a.m. to noon. If you know anybody, friends, family, neighbors that could use a Christian education, reach out. Like I said, January 30th from 10 a.m. to noon is our open house and we'd love to meet him and see him. Thank you, Pastor. I kept it short again. He beat me in the early service. My sermon was just 25 minutes longer than his this morning. Good job, Jason. <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate all you guys who willingly offer your service to, to serve and volunteer on our behalf. Uh, just a couple of other things. I was asked to read this to you this morning um, from Ms. Alert. Dear members of Emmanuel, after much deliberation and prayer, I've come to a decision regarding the call to be child care director at St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Marathon, Wisconsin. The Lord has led me to return this call and continue serving here at Emmanuel. Thank you for your prayers and kind messages during the past weeks. It is a privilege working with you to carry out the mission of Emmanuel Lutheran Church and School. I pray that the Lord will bless the work at both congregations so that it may be done to the glory of God and the welfare of his kingdom. In Christ's service, Bethany Alert. I think that probably deserves a round of applause. <clears throat> this is the wonderful thing about serving our God, right? Um, had she chosen to go, we would be thankful and praise God for that too. But we're especially thankful that God uh, answered our prayers and is keeping her right here and we have such a truly gifted staff and faculty. Thank you for reaching out to her and praying for her. And um, don't be afraid to tell her how happy you are that she's staying here and continuing to serve among us. Uh, then just one reminder, if you had uh, one of these in your worship folder this morning, if you take the time to fill that out and put that in the offering plate as you leave, we would love to know whether you fill it out online with the, with the QR code or do it with a pen or a pencil. We'd love to know that you worshiped with us this morning. Uh, I think those are all of my announcements. Then just go with this confidence. This week, you have something to share. Man, do you. You have a God who loves you desperately, who has done everything to make you his, and now has entrusted with you the wonderful privilege of sharing that good news. Have a great week. <laughs>